As we know, after his resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days providing his disciples with tangible and visible proof that he was indeed alive. Like Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness prior to the beginning of his own ministry, these 40 days spent with their resurrected Lord prepared the discipleship community for the challenges they were about to face together. And at the end of his time with them, Jesus told the disciples to stay in Jerusalem, to wait for the promise of the Father, which was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit they would experience 10 days later on the day of Pentecost. The disciples, however, were anxious, anxious to know what the future would entail, or more importantly, anxious was about was that future completely up to them. And so they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time you will restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, at first, Jesus didn't give them a timeline, nor any detailed plan. Instead, he gave them a mission statement. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, if we imagine those coordinates, Jesus' directions would sound like this. Stay here in this holy place until you receive the outpouring of the Spirit. Then leave this city and go to the outlying community, Judea, the place where you're comfortable among familiar people and familiar places. There you shall be my witnesses. Then move beyond your comfort zone and go to those people whom you have been taught to believe are your worst enemies living in Samaria. There too you shall be my witnesses. Then go to the people you don't even know Strangers, foreigners, people who are far different from you. There too, in each and every encounter, you shall be my witnesses until your testimony spreads to the ends of the known world. Sounding way too much to them like mission impossibles, the disciples are stunned. All they could do was stand there looking up to heaven, wondering what to do next. And as we heard, suddenly two messengers appear before them. And they immediately recognize them. The same two men that appeared at the tomb on that Easter morning. And rather than offering the disciples words of assurance, they bluntly state the obvious. Jesus has been taken from you. Words we can only imagine would have triggered a whole nother bout of fear and anxiety within those disciples. So what do they do? They retreat back down the mountain and return to the upper room, hoping the Holy Spirit will come and find them. The disciples had received their new life in Christ but they had not yet received the new spirit to live out the reality of their new life. 
They were still stuck in the spirit of what was rather than the spirit of what could be. Now, what we know sitting in this room and what we will celebrate next Sunday is that the Holy Spirit did come and find them as they were gathered together in one place. And receiving the spirit of new life to become apostles, they were then able to witness to the resurrection power of God at work in their lives in Jerusalem, in Samaria, at the seacoast, in Damascus, in Antioch, in Asia Minor, in Europe, and finally Rome. And then generations after them witness to the resurrection power of God to the ends of the earth. Those early apostles learned what all followers of Jesus learn. That waiting for God to act is meant to be a community project. They did not scatter to the winds, each of them going their separate ways, hoping to receive their own personal anointing of the Holy Spirit. They were joined together in a specific place, waiting for God's outpouring of the Spirit on the whole community. Together, they received the gift of ascension, letting go of the life as it had been with Jesus, to which they were desperately clinging in order that God might bless them with a new spirit for the new life they were already beginning to live. And that, my friends, is the work that is necessary for the church today to move forward into a new mission where the strategic plan is the same, to witness to the resurrection power of God in this holy place, then moving beyond these walls into our own community of familiar people and familiar places and then going wider into foreign territory until our personal testimony reaches to the end of our known world. This Easter tide, we've been celebrating all the wonderful ways in which we know what we believe through our study and our worship how we live what we believe through the stewardship of our time and our talents and our treasure, how we share what we believe by witnessing to others of our own personal experience of the transformational power of Jesus Christ in our lives. This morning, we are asked to consider our tangible witness to that power through the offering of our tithes. Being faithful of our stewardship of all of our life together means deciding how to use our spiritual, our temporal, our financial resources to fulfill our particular calling for this particular moment. What gifts do we give to one another simply by being present in this community together. Our commitment to justice, where do those gifts come from? And how and with whom will we share them? Even as we continue to wrestle together with these questions, next Sunday we will again pledge ourselves and our resources to nurture one another and to participate together 
in participating in Christ's work of redeeming the world. In this waiting time, may we pray together for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for the new reality in which we are now living, to ask our Lord to reveal to us what is it that we need to let go of, that we might receive the spiritual resources we need to move forward into the future of his unfolding. May God give us the spirit we need to live the new life we have already begun living. Amen.